Thank you very much. So everybody here is ready to give blood, is that right? So everybody wants to line up? Okay. I worked earlier today, so um, I do want to thank you all for coming. Um, and I need to go through my talk. Okay. So uh, I'm going to be giving a presentation here about aging uh, and give a little bit of research that we're doing here at Pennington and other places about aging. And then Dr. Gahan is going to talk and give a geriatrician's perspective on aging. Both Dr. Gahan and I are part of the Institute for Dementia Research and Prevention. Have you folks heard about that? Yes, all right. Are any of you in IDRP studies? All right. So first I want to say thank you all for participating. We can't do what we do without folks like you. So, um, and hopefully we'll encourage a few other folks to join. So the first question I always do whenever I uh, give a presentation like this is to ask, does everyone age the same across the United States? No. Okay. And usually no one answers. So this is good. Got an interactive group. Usually people just sit there. So. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. The answer is people do not age uh, equally across the United States. While we hear every year that average lifespan is increasing, you know, every year they say, you know, it's increasing this much more, and that's relative to Japan. You know, Japan has the highest rates. And, um, and so the idea is uh, uh, what, what, are, what are those average rates across? When we talk about averages, we, if we then look on a county-by-county -county basis throughout the United States or state-by-state, -state, what does it look like? Whoops, sorry. So life expectancy is increasing. It's currently around 80.2 years of age. But whenever you look at um, ac across the United States, you can see that there's a wide discrepancy. So we have folks that uh, here in the tan areas down here in, in the south, we uh, have a much lower life expectancy than other places in the United States. Um, and uh, the, I could, again, overlay this with all sorts of things. It could be the stroke belt, the diabetes, uh, the stroke belt, diabetes belt, cancer belt. Wherever you look, it looks something like this, moving from East Texas up into West Virginia. And so, and no matter which disease we look at, Louisiana is a nice little belt buckle there for all of the, the different belts that we have here uh, in regards to health uh, issues. And so it should not be, it, it should not be surprising that whenever people, because of the lower life expectancy, that people down in the South who develop uh, age-related diseases earlier in life and they die from them sooner in, than other places in the country. Uh, so why is that? What are the reasons? Um, we do not know. Uh, so what we do is we, do, we try to figure it out. We do association studies and research and try to understand what's the relationship uh, between different things in this life expectancy. And whenever you look at the incidence of obesity, diabetes, and low physical activity, what you see is that there's a, a mirroring of a lot of that. It doesn't explain everything. It's not the, the, the sole factor. But clearly, there's a relationship between the incidences of obesity and the diabetes, as well as low physical activity and life expectancy. And uh, one of the things that I'll be um, emphasizing today is that when we think about um, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, obesity, and influences on health, we need to move from just thinking about them in terms of heart health or kidney health. Uh, we need to also consider that each of these things is a risk factor for the development of age-related dementia. Um, so what happens in between your ears isn't in isolation there, that organ is affected by each of those conditions just like your heart is, just like your kidney or your liver and all of those. And uh, that's part of what we do here at Pennington. So another surprising thing to a lot of people is when we look at the incidence of obesity. So here we're looking from 1979 to 2004 in all the different age groups. You can see that there's increases in obesity rates uh, here. But also, we have huge increases in obesity in eight people age 75 and over. Um, so you, you really have to stop thinking about obesity as being a, a, an issue in children or young adults. Uh, it is an issue throughout the lifespan. And of course, these people here who, have, uh, who are overweight or obese uh, in midlife are, of course, at increased risk uh, for the development of dementia and strokes and other issues later on in life. Um, but we, we, we really 
are just now starting to understand these increases. So these people age 60 and over, so 55 to 64, these, this, this increase here in the incidence of obesity, how is it going to impact how people age and, and uh, uh, how we uh, control their health uh, in, a, in a positive way as they age? And the short answer is we're, it's going to have unprecedented effects on how uh, uh, the health of the elderly is managed. And it's going to uh, dramatically uh, modulate how we manage diseases in the elderly. And the example that I always use uh, whenever I do this is the, in pediatrics. So 30 years ago, it was a very rare thing to have someone under the age of 16 who was a type 2 diabetic. It was uh, an anomaly. A lot of times, grand rounds in a hospital would highlight them because it was so rare. Never saw it. Now you're talking one in eight children under the age of 16 are type 2 diabetics. And, and medical journals and research is now going, how early do you start your pre-adolescent on statins? How early do you start them on metformin? Um, all of these things are being discussed. Clearly, it's going to change the trajectory of health for that individual throughout their life, not just in the pediatric setting, but as they become adults and then, uh, of course, as they hopefully become elderly. And so that, that, that's really changing how we look at uh, aging and um, why we need research uh, even more today. The medical complications of obesity, again, we all know about the metabolic diseases that, they, they, that obesity is linked to. But in addition to that, I, I just want to drive home once again that you've you got to think about uh, it's not just a disease of the heart or the kidney or the liver. These things directly impact the brain as well. Um, and, you know, this is where I start to get into a little bit of how we think about obesity. So you guys have all heard about the apple versus pear shape and the difference between how much, where the fat is, not necessarily how much fat that you have. And so those people that have visceral fat, the fat next to the organs, of course, is much, much, much worse than people that have subcutaneous fat, so the fat in the hips or underneath the subcutaneous uh, in, um, the, under the skin. Uh, is a much, uh, this is a much more beneficial setting than this one. And so I just show these slides just to kind of, it's uh, why we do research, because it's not just how much uh, adipose tissue an individual has, but it's, it's where, where, where the fat is actually located. And I also use this as an example of why we need to do research. So I just told you all of these horrible things about uh, obesity and we definitely want to avoid it, and it's definitely uh, something that we, we, we need to change. So if I ask you, should someone age 65 and over who's overweight or obese, should they lose weight, what would the answer be? Yeah. 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 So that's why we do research, because the answer is much less clear. Um, one of the biggest risk factors for imminent death is weight loss. So people who lose a dramatic uh, amount of weight in a very short time frame raise the um, interest of people like Dr. Gahan in the hospital. It's one of the biggest risk factors and indicators of imminent death. Um, it also uh, is linked to some other things that I'll show you right now. So if you, there's a very good investigator named Dr. Deville in uh, New Mexico. He has very good studies in the elderly where he induces weight loss through very well controlled diet as well as exercise programs. And he is outstanding at making people age 65 and over lose weight and keep the weight off. And so what he's able to do, and so here's the weight loss, um, talking about uh, sustained weight loss of 6% or more. And he's able to do this for long periods of time, and so he studies these people. And so one of the things that they looked at is what else happens to these people whenever they lose weight under these very healthy, controlled, rigorous conditions. And one of the surprises is, is that they lose bone density, and they lose significant bone density in all of the areas of the body that you don't want to lose bone density. And so um, just, the, just the impact of um, weight loss and imminent death and weight loss and bone density loss, you know, these are issues where the NIH right now is actively pursuing and making places like Pennington around the country do research on this and to understand uh, should people age 65 and over um, who are obese or overweight lose weight? And uh, it's a very active area of research. And so 
that's an example that I give um, that my uh, mother understands and likes uh, and, and is very clear. Um, she, like I always say, she still doesn't know exactly what it is I do. So the uh, so what do we do here at Pennington for uh, elderly research? Well, I moved here six years ago to start the IDRP, Institute for Dementia Research and Prevention, and was very lucky to hook up with folks like Dr. Gahan and great medical team has now been assembled uh, at Pennington for doing aging research, uh, in particular in the area of fall risk and dementia. And that is uh, uh, a major thing that we do. In addition to having pharmaceutical trials, which Dr. Uh, Gahan will mention, um, the, 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 the main area of research is understanding how changes in individuals' cognition relate to how well they move in the environment, moving how far you move from your bed every day, and how well, how much assistance you need in doing that, uh, as well as the quality, quantity, and patterns of your movement, and how all of that relates to fall risk. The bottom line take home message is, as your cognition declines, your interaction with the environment around you also declines. And that includes how well you communicate with others in the environment, how far you move from your bed every day, and how well you move from your bed every day. And so one of the examples that I give uh, from our own research here at Pennington is if you take individuals who have something called mild cognitive impairment. In this study, it's a couple hundred folks. These are people that have objective, meaning it's not, uh, it's not our thoughts, it's not our subjective. These people have actual declines in cognition that are beyond what would be explained for aging. And we look at these individuals and say, how has their mobility changed um, um, relative to uh, age, education, gender-matched control individuals? And so whenever you look at the number of steps that these people take a day, there's no difference. So uh, people that are mild cognitively impaired and controlled, there's no difference in the amount of steps that they take. However, if we then say, what about the, the amount of moderate to vigorous physical steps that they take? It's a very specific uh, quality of movement that they make in a given day. And what you can see is they have a five and a half minute uh, decrease, 33% decline. It's, there's no difference in the amount of sedentary activity. There's no difference in the amount of leisure activity. I can go on and on. This is the one that's different. And so what does that mean? That means that there is an association between the amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity a person gets and the presence of mild cognitive impairment. Okay? And we believe this is clinically significant. It means that um, if we can make sure that people who are, have mild cognitive impairment do not have this deficit, in other words, they get the correct amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity, we may be able to reverse this condition or at least prevent people from developing uh, Alzheimer's disease, prevent them from progressing. And it's very easy for us to measure this in individuals in real time on a given day. And so we can design interventions where we're able to through a text, an email, a phone call, a visit from me, uh, to be able to make sure these people get the right amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And this is another example that my mom really likes that uh, shows how we observe why research is so important. It allows us to find these cues, find these questions, uh, and then test them. Association studies do not prove causality. They're just associations. Um, they, uh, to prove causality, you have to uh, design a study that randomizes individuals into different groups and then does a very controlled, safe intervention in them to see what the impact is. And that's what we do here at Pennington. So the idea is folks can come into our studies and get free screening. So uh, they come in and they get free cognitive assessments and free uh, fall risk assessments and they're able to know how they do year to year. So they're able to understand how they've changed over time and we're able to pick up things that uh, they otherwise would not be able to detect. So it's sort of like a brain physical, if you will, every year. Uh, this year's tests are going to be a lot more difficult. So, <laughs> so the idea, we, uh, we're now six years into the study and we realize that we need to make things more rigorous to have that early detection. And so uh, it's not that bad, but it is a little more, uh, it allows us to uh, have a lot more sensitivity. And so the idea is every year you come in, you can remain stable, yay. You can have cognitive impairment, not so good, or you can develop a dementia. And again, we can do association and figure out what's going on with each of these groups. How can we keep everybody up here or keep people from progressing from here to here? 
For those individuals who do have a dementia, we have something called the Joe Lamar Dementia Study. We do a workup of these individuals and make them a, uh, also know, make them aware of the studies that we have for individuals with Alzheimer's. We have a great phys physician referral network that we're growing here. And so uh, we're research only, so we don't compete with any of the local docs. They like sending their folks here to us. We're a partner with them. And the idea is that once you're in the Joe Lamar Dementia Study, you can find out about the clinical trials that we have. There are no disease-modifying medications for Alzheimer's disease. It's the only disease in the top 10 that has no disease-modifying medications. When I moved here six years ago, if you wanted to be in a study for Alzheimer's disease and get access to a clinical trial, you had to go to Birmingham or you had to go to Houston. So we've lowered that barrier. We have two trials ongoing now. We'll have six total in June. Um, those are studies that people can find out about um, by going to our website. We have a great website um, and uh, phone numbers, emails, all of that. It's also the place you go. Anyone who's age 60 and over who wants to get that free physical every year, it's free. The only thing we ask is that you come back. Uh, the NIH grades us on how well we have people come back every year. So it's very important that folks come back. 87% of our folks come back year after year, and that includes those folks that move, die, uh, whatever. Uh, so the, the idea is, uh, yeah, well, we, we, we're going to lose some folks, okay? So the idea is if you're alive, if you're alive, they come back, okay? Um, we actually have, believe it or not, we have folks that come, I have folks that have moved away that still come back, folks as far away as Washington. We have, we have folks, we have families that design their family reunion around their assessments. So we have folks that come in from all over, and we draw now from Pensacola all the way to Houston. We have 2,000 people, age 60 and over, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it, we really couldn't do with what we do without folks uh, like you all participating. Um, so now... What I'm going to do is turn it over to Dr. Gahan to give his geriatrician's view of aging. Uh, I don't know whether he did it as well in the second time around as he did the first time around, but what's the message from Dr. Keller's talk? M move? Did somebody say it? Okay, he's right. Okay, you got it right. Okay, movement is the key. Okay, we got to keep moving. If we keep moving, then we won't need all those folks up on the second floor over there that are giving the other talks about heart disease and fixing bones and so forth because we'll have, we'll have less heart disease and we'll have less uh, broken bones and we won't need those folks, but you'll still need me because you're going to get old, okay? <laughs> That's the other message he gave you. Everybody gets old, okay? And uh, so that's the nice thing about being a geriatrician. We're in the growth industry uh, of this country. Um, so, so what I'm here to talk about is a little bit more about healthy aging and, and so forth. Movement is key. Uh, it, it helps prevent heart disease. There are many studies now that have shown that it also promotes brain health. People who move, keep active, uh, stay involved with their community, uh, with, their, with their friends and relatives. Uh, those people do better from a, from a cognitive standpoint than people who do not. Um, so that's, that's one point I want to drive home here today uh, w without question. One of the things Dr. Keller talked about is our drug studies. And, you know, one of the things I, I talk about, uh, talked about earlier today is there is this theory that uh, for each species there's a square survival curve. And so for the Drosilla fly, you know, there's this, this curve and all the flies do real well, all the flies do real well, and then suddenly they drop off and all die, all at the same time. I think for that fly it's around 28 days and it makes it very easy to study uh, some genetic patterns on that fly because everybody okay, just dies off real quickly. But what happens in us humans? Okay, well, first off we have a little blip uh, after we're born or right around birth because of prenatal health. And we need to do a better job in this country and here in Louisiana about getting better prenatal health. The people downstairs from Women's Hospital will harp on that, I know. Okay, so, so that's one, one decrement. So now we're already below everybody surviving. And then we get to be 18 to 24, and we have two factors in the 18 to 24-year-old group that impacts uh, survival. Number one is guns, and we all know we have too many guns in this community. 
And number two is automobile accidents, and we have the highest insurance rate for automobiles in this community. So if we did a better job there, we could, we could cut down on, uh, we could increase human survival. By the time we get to be 40 or 45 or 50, it used to be, it used to be that people died of heart disease. And I remember very vividly being in the emergency room in, in uh, St. Louis 35 years ago. Ooh, that hurt. Um, to say that, that is. Uh, but being in the ER in, uh, in St. Louis 35 years ago, and for a week we'd see somewhere between 5 and 10 40 to 50 year old men who came in with their first heart attack and invariably two or four of them would die that week. Okay? Stasel, you've seen our emergency room uh, today. We don't see as many 40 and 50 year old men coming in with heart disease. Our, our patients are coming in at 60 and 70 with their first heart attack because big pharma, okay, has been able to provide us with better drugs in order to reduce the risk for heart disease and delay the onset of heart disease. So we have drugs like the beta blockers, we have drugs like better hypertensive drugs, and there's, there's five or six classes that we can talk about in that group. We have statins that we talked about earlier in the, in the presentation uh, that, have, that have made sure that people survive much longer. So big farmers made a big change there. And then we get to be 70, 65, 70, 75, 80. If we're not moving, what happens? We get weak and we fall and we fracture a hip. And hip fractures uh, about 10 years ago cost uh, Medicare about $8 billion. Eight, that's a B, billion dollars in, in cost of care. Okay, so, so that also leads to, oh, well, the other thing that hip fractures lead to is the institutionalization. About 50% of people who fall and break their hip end up in a nursing home. Okay, so, so that's, a, that's a significant factor. All of those can, can, all of those diseases that we just talked about, okay, can be delayed, pushed off, pushed back by movement and exercise. And so, and, but if you do all that, then what happens? Well, we start seeing the emergence of dementia. Uh, dementia Alzheimer's disease, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between the two, but Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in this country today. It's also, as Dr. Keller mentioned a little bit earlier, the only disease in that top ten, okay, that has no therapeutic intervention that modifies the disease course. Okay, for heart disease, when I was um, back uh, looking for a residency, I had the opportunity to uh, to interview with Dr. Hurst, who at that time was the author of the, the book on heart disease. And that book in 1973, 70, 70, 75, 76, that book, okay, stated that once patients developed heart failure, their average life expectancy was three years. Today, thanks to Big Pharma, we have people who live 10, 15 years with heart failure that we can modify with the, with the addition of our current uh, pharmaceutical drugs that, that have been developed over the last 30 years. Okay? So we need to do a better job in finding compounds that will modify this condition that is our sixth leading cause of death. The compounds that we have today can't make the claim that they modify the disease. The disease progresses even though there may be some modest benefit from adding Aricept or Namenda to a patient's medical regimen, I think what we really do is we modify the amount of time that caregivers have to spend caring for patients with this disease by using these drugs, but we don't really affect the underlying cause or the progression of disease by using these drugs. So we're actively now in the process of investigating drugs that actually are projected based on what we see in animal studies to perhaps modify uh, those changes in the brain that Dr. Alzheimer's de described so well back in 1906. So in 1906, he described two changes in the brain. Okay, one was the deposits of a protein that we now know is amyloid, okay? And we know that, that those amyloid deposits begin to deposit in the brain some 15 to 20 years prior to the development of cognitive impairment. 
So this is potentially a disease that if we could modify those deposits, prevent those deposits, we could prevent the development or delay the development of cognitive impairment the same way we do with using cholesterol-lowering drugs to delay uh, and prevent heart disease. Um, the other characteristic that, uh, that Dr. Alzheimer described is neurofibril tangles. And so far, we don't have a, a compound that addresses the, the neurofibril tangle issue with this disease, although there are pharmaceutical companies that are, that are looking into that. Uh, we know, as I say, stated earlier, that um, these, these amyloid deposits begin 15 years, 20 years prior to the development of cognitive impairment. Uh, there are studies being done in this country, are uh, being designed in this country, to look at using some of these drugs that, that modify the deposits of amyloid within the brain and begin to give those to people who are at high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Though that small group of people who have an autosomal dominant form of the disease where it gets passed from generation to generation and the onset of disease is in the 40s or 50s, uh, taking patients who have this autosomal dominant defect and beginning them on therapy before they develop cognitive impairment to see if we can we can reduce the incidence of disease or delay the incidence of disease uh, going forward. We're looking at these same sort of compounds in patients with Alzheimer's disease or with mild cognitive impairment. And that's where the LaBrain study uh, comes in because we can identify people very early on who are developing mild cognitive impairment and perhaps get them into a trial with a, uh, a compound that will modify their disease and um, improve their outcome. Uh, but, you know, science being science, we don't know that it will do that. We have, to, we have to prove that it will do that, and that's what we're about here at Pennington. We also have some other compounds that we'll be studying that will be add-on compounds to our current armamentarium of uh, Aricept and, and Namenda that perhaps can make the patient more aware, more attentive during the day, and therefore also lessen the burden on their caregivers. I want to mention that Alzheimer's disease being the sixth leading cause of death is also the highest cost uh, of disease that we have. Okay? We spend more money in caring for patients with Alzheimer's disease than we do with any other, uh, than we do with any other disease. And that doesn't even include the amount of uncompensated care that patients receive from family members, friends, relatives, and neighbors uh, to help them uh, survive and uh, maintain their independence in our communities.